Welcome back to the Lightning Podcast, a show dedicated to studying and exploring God's Word. I'm your host, Adam Casalino. I've been reading through the book of Genesis recently and just trying to study it and, and see what I could learn, what the Lord will teach me and show me. And when I got to Genesis chapter 3, there was so much that I was beginning to see and understand. There's so much we could learn from just this chapter that we could take a long time to talk about it. But I'm going to focus on a few things that kind of stuck out to me. Genesis chapter 3 kind of shows us a template of how deception works, how temptation works, how the enemy works. And by studying it and understanding it, we could actually gain uh, some insight into how to overcome um, lies and deceit. And the Lord wants us to be wise. He says to be as shrewd as serpents and as innocent as doves. And we also know that one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit is discernment. And discernment means to know the difference between one thing or another. To know the word for judge. And while God says we are not to judge people, we are to judge things. We are to judge truth from error. We are to judge light from darkness. We are to judge good from evil. And Hebrews says a mature person in the Lord is able through practice to tell the difference. And that's no more more important than when it comes to figuring out what is truth and what is a lie. The key to all that is studying God's word and gaining wisdom and knowledge from him so that you can recognize deception when it comes. Because the most dangerous lies aren't big obvious ones. If I come up to you and said, ah, the sky is green, you could immediately say, shut up. (laughs) That's not true. That's pretty obviously a lie. And very rarely are lies like that. Most of it lies, most deception starts with something much more subtle. And believe it or not, God gave us a template right here in Genesis chapter 3. Before we get into it, I just want to give a word about the book of Genesis. In an earlier podcast a while back, I encouraged you to study books of the Bible that may be more challenging to you. Maybe books from the Old Testament that might be difficult to understand or might be maybe even a little confusing, maybe even boring to you. But I said that's good because when we read something we don't understand from the Bible, it encourages us to seek the Lord for the answer. And when we do gain an answer, we remember and appreciate it all the more because it took us time to think about it. But when it comes to the book of Genesis, I don't know how many Christians really take it seriously. Partly because growing up, if you grew up in church and in Sunday school, you heard all these stories before. You heard about Noah, you heard about the garden, you heard about Joseph and Egypt. And maybe you're so familiar with it, you don't really give it a second thought. Or maybe you've kind of written it off. Or maybe you're among people, even Christians, who think the book of Genesis is a fairy tale or a fable or just some sort of allegorical parable. And it's not literally literally true. But what's important to know is that whenever we study the Bible, there are certain rules of interpretation that we need to abide by so we can get a better understanding and we can't we won't get led astray. Now, some people kind of write off the Bible or, or try to avoid believing the Bible by saying it's just symbolic or it's just a bunch of parables and moral teachings. It's not literally true to try to sweep under the rug the truth of God and the truth of Jesus Christ. But we can't just pluck things from the Bible and decide on our own, whether it's symbolic or just figurative or just a parable or symbolism, we need to look at what the actual book says. Now, if you were to read, uh, you know, a a biography of a famous person, like the biography of Steve Jobs, and you were to read this account, you would never assume what the book was meant to be. You know that it is a historical record of a person's life because the book itself says so. So when you pick up that book, you don't go, oh, what does this book mean? I don't know. No, you look at the actual book and it tells you what it means. And the same thing goes if you pick up Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. You would never think, whoa, this is a history of the land of England. Of course not. You know right from the context. And when you pick up the book, that it's a work of fiction. And so the same thing for the books of the Bible. We know the books of the Bible. There are 66 books that make up the Bible. Okay, it's a collection of books written over a period of time by various authors. But each book within that book, within the context, it's evident what style of writing it is. God is a creative God, and while he spoke to us through the entire Bible, he used different styles of language to communicate his truth to us. So you would never look at the book of 
the Song of Solomon and go, gee, what, what is this? It's right there in the title. It's a song. It's a wedding song celebrating the marriage between a man and a wife, and it celebrates romance and their union. It's very evident. In the book of Proverbs, right in the first few verses, it tells us this is a book for gaining wisdom and understanding. In the book of Psalms, each psalm starts with a little introduction, often telling us who wrote it and what it's for. So we don't have to guess, oh my goodness, what does this mean? Each book, there is a very clear context of what kind of writing it is. So we can't just say, oh, this is just symbolic. It has no, you know, no. If we're going to bother to read the Bible, we have to look at what the Bible says about itself. In the New Testament, there are letters written by a specific person to a specific audience. And we understand from the very introduction of those books what they're about. The Gospels introduce themselves with, this is an account of Jesus Christ. And even books where they switch literary styles, there is a very clear indication, like the book of Daniel. It opens up a historical account of Daniel's life in the Babylonian Empire. And then after a certain point, it shifts to describe some of these very profound dreams and visions Daniel received from God. And of course, there's a lot of symbolism in all that. And then he, because he explains it, and then there's explanations about what it means, and he has visitations from angelic beings. And we know the difference between what was literally happening and what was symbolic. So you can't just grab a passage and say, oh, this is symbolism because I want it to be. No, if you're going to take the Bible seriously, we got to read it and study it as it was intended. And there's nothing in the book of Genesis or the next four books, what we call the Pentateuch or the Torah, the law, that suggests it's anything other than literal historical record of some of the earliest periods of human history. And if you were to read, there's parts of Genesis, like Genesis chapter 10, that records the genealogies of the descendants of Noah, very detailed. That's not symbolism. And then from chapter 12 on, it records the history of men like Abraham, his son Isaac, his son Jacob, and his son Joseph. And it's very clearly a historical record of these people who are the patriarchs or the founding fathers of the nation of Israel. So if we're willing to acknowledge that, then we have to acknowledge the first few chapters of Genesis are also historical accounts. Now, a lot of people have contested Genesis chapter 1 and 2 because it speaks of God creating the world. And most people who argue those, either writing them off as not true or saying, oh, it's just symbolism. Oh, it's, it's, it's less to do with them thinking it's so contradictory to scientific evidence, which is a whole other discussion. Lord willing, we could explore that one day. It has more to do with them not liking the idea that there is a God who created the world and has something to say about how we live our lives. That's what it boils down to. So anyone who tries to write off the book of Genesis, they're writing off the whole Bible because it's the foundation of everything else that comes after it. So if we're going to take the Bible seriously, we need to first look at these books as literal accounts of what God did, unless the context suggests it's a symbolic vision or a dream or a work of poetry of prophetic significance, which again, the books will tell us that. So with that out of the way, let's take a look at Genesis chapter 3. To recap, God created the world, he created Adam and Eve, he put them in the garden, and he gave them very clear instructions. Genesis chapter 2, he spoke to Adam and he said, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. From the day you eat of it you shall surely die. Before that, in chapter 1, he told Adam and Eve, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. God made man, and from man he took a rib and made the woman. He put them in this beautiful garden, and he gave them some very simple rules. He said, Fill the earth. Have lots of kids. Fill it out with people. He said, Eat from all the trees of the garden except for one. He had a very simple life. And compared to ours, they didn't have to worry about money, they didn't have to worry about clothes, they didn't have to worry about war or famine or disease or any of these problems. All they had to do was just enjoy the world God gave them. With one very simple rule, don't eat from this one tree. Now in Genesis chapter 3, we see how Adam and Eve ruined all of it. Chapter 3 might be one of the most significant chapters in the Bible. It, it, it recounts perhaps the most important moment in human history next to the cross. Because this chapter explains everything else that's ever happened in human history. All the bad, all the pain, all the suffering. And it starts with an incredibly orchestrated and crafted lie or series of lies from the enemy. 
This is the very first lie that was ever told. Jesus says Satan is the father of lies. It started right here. This is the moment where Satan decides to turn against God and convinces humanity to turn against God and do disobedience. There's a lot going on in this chapter. But what I want to focus on, at least for today, is how Satan lied. Because believe it or not, if you took what Satan says here to a court of law, you, you could argue that nothing he said was untrue. And that's the important thing that I wanted to first note, is that not all lies are straightforward, blatant falsehoods. Some of the most effective lies are entirely true. It's just certain things have been left out to lead you into assuming something that is false. And that's why this is such a powerful and dangerous lie, and why we as people today can easily fall for the same kind of lies, and we need to guard our hearts and guard our minds with the Word of God. Because if Adam and Eve fell and they were perfect, what about us? So let's start Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Okay, let's stop there for a moment. Now, in a previous podcast, I talked about this chapter in the podcast where I I explored the question, If God is good, why do bad things happen? If there is a God, why do bad things happen? And I talked about this a little bit about the significance of Satan's lie here. The, the question that he puts forward proves that it's a lie because there's no possible way anyone on the earth at that time would not have known what God had said. It wasn't like Satan was off on some other side of the planet and he didn't hear God when God commanded Adam not to eat, eat of the tree. The Bible describes Satan in other parts in Isaiah and Ezekiel as a, as a beautiful, angelic being who served God and was in the Garden of Eden. So he was there when God told Adam, don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He was also there when God told him, you could eat from any tree you want except for this one tree. So when the serpent came to Eve and said, did God really say you shall not eat of the tree of the garden? The very fact he asks that proves that he's lying because either he would have not heard God at all and said, what did God say? Or he would have known exactly what God said. The fact that he claimed to not know or misremember it proves that he's being deceptive. And what's so interesting about this is that he's not coming with a straight, direct lie. Paul describes his act here as being subtle. He comes along and he's almost like pretending to be an ally to Eve. Did God really say that? Did God say that to you? Do you ever have people, like like gossipy people, come along and say... Did you hear what they said? Can you believe what they said? Did they really say that to you? And they're not trying to help you. They're just trying to manipulate you and and instigate more conflict between you and the person they're talking about. And see here, the first thing that Satan tries to do is to undermine Adam and Eve's understanding and and knowledge of God's word. Because at this point, the only direct word from God they've heard was, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, and you could eat from any of the trees except for this one. So it's pretty simple, pretty straightforward, but immediately that one bit of truth that God has given them, Satan's trying to undermine. And again, it's not a direct lie. It's a question. But in, within the question, he's twisting it. Did God say you shall not eat of every tree in the garden? No, it may seem like this is a very easy thing to refute. But like most questions, like the questions that the Pharisees tried to ask Jesus, these aren't lit sincere questions. They're meant to be a trap. The answer you should have said was, you're lying, you know what God said, now get away from me. Not if she was really grounded in what God had said. But instead she falls for the trap and just tries to answer what the devil asked, and she gets it wrong. Notice what she said, God said, you shall not eat of it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Now what's so interesting is that God never said, don't touch it. I mentioned this in the previous podcast. Maybe Adam and Eve needed to touch it. Maybe they were, had to prune it or, 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 or it's just there in the middle of the garden and they would walk past it or move around it. We don't know, but God never said, don't touch it. We need to, it's another lesson here. We need to understand what God says specifically directly to us and not add to it or interpret it our own way. What's so interesting about this is that right here, we get a glimpse of what we like to call legalism within the body of Christ. 
You see, God's make it very clear the difference between right and wrong and how Christians should live their life. Paul describes it in the book of Galatians, walk by the Spirit and you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. So the Bible teaches us that in order to be pleasing to God as a believer in Jesus, we and we want to abstain from sin, it is imperative. The only way we could do that is by walking by the Spirit, which means we need to be empowered by God's Holy Spirit to avoid sin and to bring glory to God. It's a work of the Holy Spirit, not our own efforts by obeying rules and regulations. But Christians for hundreds, thousands of years, so terrified of sinning, adds to that by creating their own list of rules that go beyond the Word of God to control and dictate their behavior. And what that produces is is judgmental attitudes, a hostility towards other people, a holier-than-thou attitude, a, an, an idea that if we screw up as believers, God will punish us. All sorts of negative, evil, religious bondage and control that we call legalism. And it goes back to adding rules to God's word that he never said. And that's exactly what Eve did here. It's a, it's a early form of legalism because she added to the rules. The only rule God said was, don't eat from this tree. She went further. It was almost like she couldn't trust herself, so she had to add this extra rule, don't even touch it. As if that's like, that, that'll that keep you, if you don't touch it, then you can't get close enough to eat it. But by adding that extra rule, it revealed that Eve didn't know God's word. Now, in the past podcast, I, I said they both heard God speak. But to be clear, in Genesis chapter 2, God only said it to Adam. And that's important because he said it before he created Eve. Now, that doesn't mean Eve was absolved. But from the context, that suggests that it was Adam's responsibility to communicate what God had said to Eve. So what Eve said here is either she got it wrong or that Adam relayed it wrong to her. He said, just don't touch it. And Adam should have told Eve or should have explained it to Eve. But somewhere along the line, he got screwed up. And now we have Eve saying something that is not true. And that opened the door for the enemy to introduce an extremely effective lie. Because as I explain, it's not actually a lie as we think lies are. So verse 4, the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened. And you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now let's step back and look at this for a second. Now we know Satan is the father of lives. He's lying to Eve right now. He's trying to get Adam and Eve to disobey God, obey him, and sin. And when they sin, they would suffer a penalty. Okay, Satan understands this. He, in this moment, is rebelling against God and trying to get Adam and Eve to rebel against God. Because as it says in the rest, in other passages, Satan wanted to be worshipped as God. He wanted to be like the Most High. So in order to do that, he needed people to worship him. That's what it was about right here. But if you actually look at what he says, if you brought this to a court of law in a very strict you know, legal setting, you could argue he didn't really lie. No, he did lie. But let's, under, let's look at what he's saying and to see how subtle, how manipulative deception can be. First thing he says is, you will not surely die. Now, was that true or not? God said, when you eat of this tree, in the day you eat of it, you will die. Satan says, you will not surely die. We can say, Satan's lying. Well, 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 wait a minute. We know they do eat of the tree, and they don't die in a certain way. See, Satan was right when he said, you will not die. They didn't die physically the moment they ate of it. So he could argue, I didn't lie. But how did they die? They did, in fact, die. They died spiritually. God cursed them, which would ultimately lead to their death. But it didn't happen immediately. What died immediately? Well, verse 6, So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. So right there in verse 7, we see the death that happened. Before that, they were innocent. They didn't know the difference between good and evil. All they knew was good. They were naked and they had no shame. But then they ate of this fruit. And the Bible says their eyes were opened. Okay, this is not a good kind of eye-opening experience. Their eyes were opened to their shame. They suddenly were exposed when before they weren't exposed. Some people believe that they had the glory of the Lord as as a spiritual covering. Now they sinned and the glory departed and now they saw their shame. And that's certainly true from a spiritual perspective. 
Our sin exposes our shame before God, and we need to cover ourselves out of fear. So they did, in fact, die. They died spiritually. And the act of being removed from the Garden of Eden, the Garden represented favor of God, being welcomed into his family, into his good graces, so to speak. So being removed from that meant they'd been cut off from God, a close relationship with God, and now they must toil and strive and eventually die. So the day they ate of it, they did die spiritually. And they would eventually die physically as a result. So God was true. But you see, the lie was that Satan left out a very important detail. No, they would not die physically on that day. But they would die in a much more profound, eternal way, spiritually. This is very, very clever of Satan to do this. So if he had to be held in a court of law, so to speak, he could say, Hey, I wasn't lying. They didn't physically die, did they? See, it's what he left out that is the deception. Some people say, most lies are true, just a little bit of deception put in, like poison. Most rat poison is mostly good food. There's just a tiny bit of poison. And that's true for many lies, but the bit of deception might not necessarily be an outright lie. It might be what is left out. So what you see that Satan did is 100% of what he said was true, but it wasn't 100% of the truth. He said, you will not surely die. That is true. They didn't physically die, but he left out the fact that they would not die or they would die spiritually. See, a lot of lies, and this is true in the world today, especially in the media and different parts of culture and our communities, our society. They'll say stuff that, that is true, but it's not the whole truth. Like when you stand before the court of law, you say, I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Now, why didn't they just say, tell the truth? Because they know lawyers can easily hide things. What they present to you is fact, but there's something they're not telling you about what really happened. So they could say, we're telling the truth. But the court requires you to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Be so help you God. Because we know you could leave certain key things out and it completely changes the story. So the next time you're watching the news or the next time you're reading some sort of book on philosophy or listening to a neighbor say something, always ask yourself this. Is this the whole truth? What am I not being told? Because God will never leave anything out. If you read and study the Bible, you will see amazing things that God did not leave out that make his people look really, really bad. Even in the book of Genesis, the sons of Jacob betrayed their own brother, sold him into slavery. And before that, they were just going to kill him. It's pretty embarrassing to the fathers of Israel, but God didn't leave it out. The great man of God, David, okay, a man after God's own heart, committed a horrible thing by having adultery with an another man's wife and then having the man killed so he could cover it up. God didn't leave that out. You see, when someone is being truthful to you, they do not leave out the painful stuff. They'll always tell you the whole truth. A liar will tell you some of the truth, but leave out the inconvenient parts. So they could say, I told you the whole, I told you 100% truth, but not all the truth. And that's exactly what Satan is doing here. Verse 5, it goes on, For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now again, this is a continuation of this very clever, very effective form of lying. Because what he said again was true. God did know that the day they ate of that fruit, their eyes were open. We saw in the next verse, their eyes were opened. But that's a very vague comment, right? Oh, my eyes are open. Okay, that sounds good. But your eyes can be open to good things, which they already were open to good things, or it can be open to evil things. There are things in this life you don't need to know about. There are things that you're not better off learning about. This is that old saying, you don't ask how the sausage is made because it could be pretty gross. It might put you off sausage for the rest of your life. Now, if you're a civilian or you're not a soldier, there are things that happen in war that you never need to know about. And if you're not a, a judge or a criminal prosecutor, you don't need to know about all the evil things people do out there. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 12, it is disgraceful to even speak of the things which are done by the disobedient in secret. There are things that we shouldn't just know about. It's not beneficial to us. You know, we could know about what the bad things that people do, but we don't need to go into all the, the gory details, so to speak. There are certain things that our eyes don't need to be open to. So just saying your eyes will be open, that sounds nice, but he didn't say what your eyes would be open to. Because Adam and Eve already had their eyes open to all the good that was in the world. 
the beautiful garden, the beautiful universe God created. They saw God. They spoke with God. He gave them this amazing life and destiny. Their eyes were open to everything that they needed to be open to. The only thing their eyes weren't open to is evil. And when they did that, what was the immediate result? They were horribly ashamed and they had to cover themselves. And then in verse 8, it says, The Lord came and they hid themselves from God. So obviously, this is not a good eye-opening experience. It's a very bad one. But again, Satan doesn't say that. He says, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. That, that's the clincher of this whole thing. The reason why Adam and Eve ultimately fell is for the same sin that Satan fell. Satan said, I want to be like the Most High. And Adam and Eve were seduced because they wanted to be like God. Now, what's ironic was that before they ate from the fruit, they were more like God than after they ate from the fruit. Why? Because the Bible says we were made in God's image and that they were in the garden. They had no sin, no flaws, no separation from God. They, were, they had no reason to be alienated from God. They're not fallen. They're, they're perfect, as we would say. They had the glory of God uh, surrounding them, you could say, in a figurative sense. God's favor was on them. They were already very much like God, as close as a human being could be like God. They weren't God. But they were the children of God, and they had no reason to want to be more like God. But the lie that Satan implied was that they could become more like God, maybe even as powerful as God. See, that's not what Satan says, but the implication is there because he said, you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. Now, again, that's not a lie. They learned good and evil. So in that very limited sense, they they would be like God. But you see, what he doesn't say is, You would be like God knowing this, but you wouldn't be God. See, he didn't ever say you will be God. He said you'll be like God because you'll now know this and only this. But what Satan doesn't say is that knowing these things isn't good for a human being. He didn't say you'll feel ashamed and filthy and want to cover yourselves. He didn't say you'll be kicked out of the garden and suffer a curse. He simply told them enough to entice them, but left out all the stuff that would have kept them away. Again, he said 100% truth, but not 100% of the truth. And that is where the deception lies. Now, if that's still a hard concept, let me give you an example. Let's say I came to you one day and I said, your best friend just punched a guy in the face. And that was 100% the truth. But that's all I told you. And you go, what? My best friend punched a guy in the face? Why would he do that? He's not a violent person. What would happen? But then you hear the whole story. You learn that your friend was at the grocery store with his mom and a crazy man walked up to him, weaving a knife. And so he got between his mom and the man and punched him in the face so he couldn't hurt his mom. Now that's a very different story, is it? He wasn't being violent and reckless and beating up a poor guy. He was defending his mom from some violent, crazy person. It's a totally different story, but both accounts were accurate, except for first account left out a whole lot of details that totally changed the story. See, this is some of the most effective and powerful deception that exists, is saying something that's true, but not the whole truth. And you leave out so much crucial detail that what you're implying is an outright lie. What Satan did is what we would say, he gave them enough rope to hang themselves on. Satan didn't force them to eat the fruit. He didn't say an outright lie, such as, you eat this fruit, you'll live forever. He never says that. He never says, you eat this fruit, you will rule the universe. He never said that. He simply said selective pieces of the truth leaving out the whole truth so that Adam and Eve in their own mind would connect the dots in a deceptive way and make a huge mistake and deliberately disobey what God already told them not to do. Now we could read the rest of the chapter and I've went over this in that previous podcast. The Lord appeared, he cursed the serpent and spoke of the promised seed who redeemed the situation and he cursed Adam and Eve and and they left the garden and of course that is the fall, the curse of sin and death, and the situation humanity's been in since that time. And after that, humanity's only accelerated in sinfulness. You know, Cain and Abel, the second generation after Adam and Eve committed murder. Cain killed his own brother. That's how fast humanity fell into sin. So we know all that, and we know the good news is that Jesus Christ went to the cross to pay the price for our sin, so that when we believe in Jesus Christ, we'll be forgiven and freed from this curse and have eternal life and a restored relationship with God the Father. That's the great promise and redemption in the Bible. So what's so important in this account? Well, we need to understand that when the enemy and the world comes to us with deception, they're not going to always come with some blatant, in-your-face lie. It's always going to be much more subtle, and it's going to be very selective, and it's going to be very 
convincing. And we see this pattern repeated again and again whenever Satan tries to lead someone astray. Every time you're tempted to every time you're tempted to sin, believe it or not, this scenario plays out to a certain extent. Satan tried the same scheme against Christ when he tempted him in the wilderness, and he was even at that point quoting from the Torah to try to lead Jesus astray because but Jesus, because he's the living word of God, refuted him. But now that we're in Christ, we could follow his example and resist the enemy. And that's the pattern we're to follow. Satan might come with you with such a convincing argument that sounds so good, sounds so believable. And he, you could even argue it's true, but he's leaving out some very important facts. He's leaving out the whole picture. So what he gets you to believe is something completely opposite from the truth. Isn't that amazing? What everything Satan said to Adam and Eve was true. But he so selectively left out pieces of it that what they ended up believing was the exact opposite of the truth. And that is how deception works. That's how our media operates. That's how people in politics operate. People in our society and so many segments of our culture operate. They'll tell you things that are very true, but they'll leave out key details so that you end up believing the exact opposite of what is true. So what's the solution? Well, like I said, the, one of the gifts of the Spirit is discernment. Seek the Lord. Ask Him to give you divine discernment. But the only way you could really test and refine your dis- God-given discernment is through studying the Word of God. As it says in Hebrews, the mature have, through practice, learned to tell the difference between good and evil. And we do that by studying God's Word. The more we know His Word, the quicker we will recognize deception when it comes to us. Because we'll hear something from the world and we'll hold it up to God's words. What does God's word say? What is the world saying? Okay, the world is lying this way, this way, and this way. And there's a lot of lies, a lot of form of lies. The Bible, Revelation, describes Satan as seven-headed dragon. Again, another picture. This, In this case, this is symbolic because it's described that Satan will come at us with many different lies. Seven different heads. Seven is the number of completion. So every lie that's out there comes from Satan. So he won't just come at you with with one lie, with many different lies, false religions, false ideas, false philosophies, different temptations of all kinds to trip you up. And the only way you know how to defend against it is through God's word. The more you study it, even those difficult passages that you may think, oh, it's too difficult. No, dig in. There's a passage of scripture you feel intimidated by. Spend some time reading it. Because that might be a passage God will reveal and unlock some really amazing truth for you that will help you in your walk. And that's the only way we can overcome this form of temptation. The only way we can recognize lies immediately and rebuke them with the Word of God is if we know the Word of God. So I hope this has helped you today. In the future, Lord willing, we'll, we'll probably spend more time in this passage in the future because, again, there's even more we can learn from it. But I hope this has helped you in some way. Thank you for listening to the Lightning Podcast. All episodes are on lightningpodcast.org, as well as Spotify and Apple Podcasts and Facebook. See you next time.